He's actually allowing that mission to be accomplished through his servants. And so what you have in the book of Acts is you actually don't have the Acts of the Apostles. You have the Acts of the risen Lord through his apostles or through his servants, through the church, and what that looks like. This is what it looks like. Acts 13, 47. God has commanded us. Matthew 28, there's the command. Make disciples of every creature, every nation, all the world, because it's all mine. And so the underlying text, Acts 13, 47, is where Paul, Paul actually quotes Isaiah 49, 6. And the successful servant Messiah had not only accomplished the mission of Israel, but now also receives a greater mission. He was to be a light for the nation so that salvation would reach to the ends of the earth. So the servants of the servant would bear the light. And Paul finds solidarity with the servant as he even calls himself, I am the least of these. I am a servant, a bond servant of Jesus Christ. See, he gets the theology of Isaiah. And these two passages reveal a definite link between the Trinity and servant light bearers. And so Paul realizes that ultimately Jesus Christ is working through Barnabas and himself to accomplish his missions. And they are servants of the servant, taking the message of the resurrection to the world. And King Jesus had instructed the disciples in the upper room, Luke 24, and Paul explains to King Agrippa in Acts chapter 26 that Christ's death and resurrection was the means by which enlightenment, forgiveness, and salvation are realized. And Paul had just previously explained in chapter 26 of Acts, verse 16, that Jesus had appointed Paul as a servant to preach the gospel, quote, to open their eyes so they may turn from darkness to light. But not just Paul, Barnabas, the church as well. So this commission cannot fail. And Isaiah's theme of the servant shows up in many of these missiological passages. You go to a famous mission passage like Romans chapter 15, where it says that Christ was made a servant to the circumcised in order to show the truthfulness of God, in order that he might confirm the promises to the patriarchs, and in order that the nations might glorify God for his mercy. So, This command that we have in Matthew 28 is great because the need is great. The command is great, but ultimately the reason this works is you have an all-sufficient one. The Lord is great. And this is what keeps people on the field. The Lord is great. Jesus says, All authority has been given unto me. It's all mine. The whole globe, it's mine. So there go anywhere in it. And make disciples of any of those people anywhere on that globe. Because it's all mine. It's all my territory. Psalm 110, sit at my right hand. The Lord says, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. Psalm 2, Ask of me, Yahweh says to his son, ask of me and I will give you the uttermost parts of the earth for your possession. So the Lord is great, it's all his, it's all mine, therefore go. And this is the promise, that the gospel of the kingdom will be preached throughout the whole world as a testimony to all nations and then the end will come. And so, when we look at a passage like Matthew 28, what we're seeing here is we see, we see there's great need. I mean, there, there's, and we know that. We know that through the doctrine of anthrop- anthropology. We know the, the need of man. But we also see that the command that God is giving actually meets that need. It's an all-compensating command to every creature. It is, God says, go make disciples and teach them everything I've commanded them. But then we also see that the Lord is great and that he is, that all belongs to him, and we are waiting for the consummation of the age. 